I'm a uh, certified safety professional working currently for a consulting company over in Manchester. And my whole career has been safety, decades of safety professional work. Um, and, you know, I've seen the whole evolution of safety engineering to health and safety to EH&S where, and now of course EH&S in facilities, EH&S in HR, so you've got lots of things on your plate. Um, I've been able to focus on mostly safety. I had security for a while and of course health and uh, some environmental, but it's, it's, you know, it's been an interesting ride. I've really enjoyed it. And one of the topics that over the past 17 years I've been doing this electrical safety related work practices. So how did I get into that? Um, well, I, my, my career is insurance and then private industry and then, and then consulting. I find it very helpful in consulting to have been in private, you know, in industry, right? To, sat, to sit where some of the, my, you know, my clients are, I walk into the office or speaking with them, I know exactly what they're dealing with. Um, on the electrical safety uh, t in my career up until 2004, 2005, was about the physical uh, uh, design, wiring design, installation uh, standard, which is a part of OSHA, some of you know. And I'm, I'm, trying to get, I'm gonna try to keep it very, um, not simplistic, but you know, not get into the, to the OSHA chapters and verses and stuff. But that's in one part of OSHA's electrical subpart, subpart S. So the other part, which is the electrical safety related work practices, um, is more recent. OSHA goes back to when? 1970, right? So we're, we're 50 years into OSHA. We're only, only 30 years into the electrical safety related work practices. So um, when I was, my, my, I was thrown into this 70, how many people don't have any idea what 70E is? All right, so this is, you've all had, I mean, it's, it's been, you know, these, these, talk, these talks have been, have been going on for a long time, which is, which is great. So I can, I just wanted to make sure that they're, you know, that that was, um, I had a feeling that was the case. So 2005, my boss says I'm, I'm new to a, a consulting company you're gonna help this large aerospace company to develop a worldwide standard based on NFPA 70E. Oh, really? Okay. Uh, sure, sure, no problem. Uh, and that's when I had to, to really start, I mean, when you're developing a program for someone, you have to, you have to do it yourself. So, uh, and I don't understand it fully. Well, it took me a long time. And uh, I, when I did training, most of my training and I'm, this isn't really training, right? It's, it's more of a little bit of a education, uh, is, for the, is to the people who, are, who have the exposures to the electrical hazards. So this is a different audience, but I had to prepare myself for the, the technical part of it. I'm not an electrical engineer. I'm not, uh, you know, I, I didn't have a lot of experience with electrical safety related work practices as opposed to going around and say, well, that ex that's an extension cord there, you can't have that, and you know, that kind of thing. I had done the property stuff. So that's how I learned, and I, I was uh, so uncomfortable. I, I said, I can't do this 70E training without an electrical engineer or somebody who can, who can um, respond to some of the questions that I anticipated. Well, that uh, soon turned out to be more this electrical engineer, and we kind of co-taught it. And that turned in very quickly to where uh, he was saying things that I knew the audience didn't understand. I said, Bob, what you just said, it took me a few weeks and I had to ask you, so I, you know, I would kind of translate. He would, do, he would talk about you know, uh, electricity and, and uh, you know, circuit breakers and fuses and stuff, and I'd say, Bob, you know, we, need to, we need to bring it down a little bit. Anyway, since then, it's been really, really interesting over the years to, to have what's really evolved to discussions with what OSHA calls qualified, uh, electrically qualified uh, people. Learned a lot and I can take it from, from session to session, right? I can, I can use something, I'm doing another one, what's today? I'm doing another one next Tuesday at a facility where um, some people have 70E, you know, I, I, I understand some people have 70E training and some people don't. What does that even mean to have 70E training? So. I want to go through these slides here and 
as we go through them, share some of my experiences with this and, and how some things that are either missed or are, I think are more important than just telling people about you know, this document, um, which I keep with me all time, you know, at all times. You heard this morning about electrical safety being a, uh, it's not an emphasis program formally uh, by OSHA, local or, or national, but if any of you have had visits from OSHA, you know that they're probably gonna ask about electrical safety. Blackout tagout is related to it, but it comes up quite a bit. So uh, it's, it's more recent, and the way I, I explain that is there have been a lot of other priorities for OSHA, um, and continue to be priorities for OSHA, but the electrical work um, practices has been, I'll say, relatively recent. Um, it's a real culture change for the folks doing the work. If, if, if you know your, your electricians, your maintenance staff, your, the contractors coming in, uh, if you've been uh, involved with them at all over the years, you know there's a certain culture that exists there where it's really a challenge. We talked about PPE enforcement and whatnot. We, uh, where's your PPE? What are you talking about? I've never worn any gloves. What are you talking about voltage rated gloves, right? So, um, so, so now they bring in somebody like me to say, okay, here's, here's what's required. <laughs> here's, what, he, here's what that means. And I actually, I think, have, have succeeded pretty well in, in, in dealing with that just because you know, we can, um, I, can, I can ask them about what they're doing and uh, have them show me, right? And, and, and apply something that's, that's, that's um, maybe been more generic uh, or generally talked about and then you go back to work and you go, I don't know what exactly this means. Is this, is this an exposed, energized part? I mean, who can define what exposed means, right? We've, we've talked about exposures. OSHA talks about exposures. What does that mean when you talk about electrical um, hazards and being exposed to the hazards and, and the risk. Risk, I'm definitely going to talk about risk and it's, it's, it's a theme, right? You heard John, um, Jordan talk about it, you heard OSHA talk about it, you heard um, even just before lunch, you know, risk, which it's, it's not just about hazards, it's about exposure to the hazards. So it's been overlooked. Why has it been overlooked? It's, it's one of those low probability, lower probability, but high severity hazard uh, risks. So it's, it's, it, it, it equates to some of the things that are happening a lot, but somebody said earlier this morning, well, that's never happened before. You know, OSHA has heard that. Well, that's never happened before. Yeah, so where is it gonna come from? It's gonna come from your assessment or, or your ability to have recognized that prior to the event from your risk assessment, which is not easy to do. And the evolution of, of 70E is, uh, many of you know, it's every few years, there's a new version of it that comes out. And when you go back in time, you'll see that the language has changed. And this is true with other consensus standards. NFPA, National Fire Protection Association, is a committee-based consensus standard, just like the American National Standards Institute, the ANSI standards. And Risk, there's so much more risk in there. My career over the, over the decades is, I've just seen that. And uh, in, in particular, uh, relative to electrical um, hazards. In, in, in 70E, the term hazard risk used to be used for PPE categories. Some of you may remember that or maybe still have it on your, if you have labels on your equipment, the stickers, if you had an arc flash analysis, it'll say hazard risk category, you know, one, two, three, or four. What's a hazard risk category? Is it a risk category? Is that, so now it's a PPE category. So even just to take that, that language out of it. So um, when you put too much emphasis on, and this was also talked about, I have, I have my little slide on it, on the hierarchy of controls, right? The effectiveness of responding to, to risk and controlling risk. You don't go right, you shouldn't right, go right to PPE how effective is PPE? Human error and people just not wearing things correctly? It's not effective, right? Not nearly as effective as farther up the, the pyramid or, you know, again, this, this hierarchy. And so that's built right into NFPA 70E. 
wasn't always there. Um, so, uh, you know, I include it on this slide here because there continues to be this emphasis on personal protective equipment when, when the, you know, when the hazards, uh, excuse me, when the risk can be mitigated, can be reduced uh, more effectively through uh, other means, substitution, uh, elimination, and so on. So it's about risk. Lots of ways to define risk. This is the most simple version, but likelihood, there are things built into the likelihood or probability. We've talked about some of that, or it's been talked about earlier today. Um, but simply, it's taking those two, and some of you have, you know, there's different matrices. I love this picture here. You may have seen it, where the, what's the, you know, what, what's going on here with the, with the ass assessment of risk? So here's my pointer. So you've got this dog, he's not, you know, completely different. Um, if, if this cat was saying, okay, how am I gonna size up these guys, these, you know, these animals? Well, uh, he's, he's well-trained, he, I'm not sure he's quite there yet. This guy's like ready to pounce. So, you know, the, the assessment of risk is uh, subjective, certainly. Uh, some of it is um, you can, you need to calibrate that. I've, I've been involved with lots of different risk discussions on other topics, machine guarding, amputation hazards, that kind of thing, and to get multiple people involved and uh, disciplines and things is very important, but then you have to calibrate. So how, how are we going to assess uh, risk? You heard, you heard uh, Jordan say, well, you know, safety sets the, sets the uh, severity or, or determines the severity where he gets the, um, Larero gets the likelihood from from the employee who is identifying the issue. Um, <laughs> so what's, what goes into the risk assessment here, right? The people, I mean, uh, when I use this in training, I actually have a different footer on it. I say, uh, safety isn't just about common sense. I, I, ne I really, really never try to use the term common sense because what's common about it? Common. We're coming at, I mean, you know, 100 people in the room here, and we're coming at this. Uh, of course, there are going to be groups of people, but they're, you know, we're not all calibrated on this. Is this, is this crazy? Is this, is, hey, no big deal? You know, what goes into that? And then I often don't show the, the next couple of slides are classic. So you got these guys, wherever they are, we don't know what it, what's plugged into. And now we got to make a decision here, right? Somebody maybe have said something like, you guys shouldn't have that grill plugged into that. So, you know, let's, let's, let's do something about it. And who knows exactly what the conversation is? And then here's the, all right, I made my call. I'm, I'm, I'm going to actually take, you know, unplug this. Really, you are. Well, what, what do you know? And, and I don't know because I, I actually haven't read about where this came from, but I thought it was, you know, I use this when we talk about electrical hazards, electrical, in this case, a shock hazard. What's the actual risk, right? It's, it's tricky. So what, what, you, what I'll be able to hopefully uh, impart to you and communicate to you is this 70E document helps, helps determine that. And there are two major hazards with electrical work. Uh, there are multiple other hazards, but the two primary hazards would be the shock hazard and the arc flash hazard. Um, NFPA 70E is not the arc flash standard. You know, that's what it's often called. Can you come and do arc flash training? I know what they mean, but it's just a part of the standard for electrical safety in the workplace, right? Standard for electrical safety in the workplace. Um, and it's about trying to change culture. So this is where we're coming from. This is where many of, you know, companies and folks still are. Not a lot of... Uh, uh, visibly not a lot of personal protective equipment, not e labeling there, you know, I can make some, um, I mean, per the uh, guidance that's in, in this standard, that is really the only tool out there right now to uh, assess, truly assess uh, risk, uh, you know, without calculations, without, without performing a study, is to, um, and, and, and put a label on, the, uh, or, or to be able to determine, excuse me, be able to determine what personal protective would be appropriate is, is through 70E, so the culture is going from that to this, right? It's, you know, you're, you've, you've got 
multiple issues here besides the fact that there's no PPE. You have a second person, you've got, you know, you've probably seen the videos where um, things do blow up, things, uh, people do touch things, and bad things happen. I think that was the, that was the, the quote from, uh, from uh, OSHA this morning. So it's a culture change. You can't change culture overnight. Um, and to try to enforce, right, you're trying to now discipline, right? Make sure you hold the employees accountable. You heard the attorney say that. Uh, yeah, good luck, right? Good luck. Because it's a complete, it's a huge culture change for electrical workers. I mean, am I right? I mean, that's probably, you know, that's what you're seeing or what you're trying to deal with, whether it be your own employees or contractors. If you walk by a contractor and, you know, they're doing something like this, hey, we, you know, we brought them in to diagnose something. Hold on, stop. What are you doing? Right? And so to, just to be able to recognize that there's an issue there as, as opposed to, oh, they must know what they're doing. So a little bit of knowledge, a little bit of more knowledge will help you a lot to, to recognize that as, we'll say, most likely a higher risk, unacceptable risk. I, as a consultant, I learned a long time ago, I can't tell people what's acceptable or not, but I can tell you that's a, a higher level of risk there. Um, so what do you need to really do, right? And, 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 and you know, how do you handle this? So first of all, who's exposed? <laughs> And that's, and I'll, I'll show you that that's a challenge because what does that even mean? But who are the people who you want to um, include in this, in this uh, audience, not in this audience, in this group of people that need more training, need more uh, understanding of, of this? And then you perform a workplace risk assessment. NFPA 70E requires, and if you're, if you're elected, OSHA doesn't require a written electrical safety program at this point, but 70E does. So if you say, we comply with NFPA 70E, the first thing I ask is, so which, which version, right? It goes back really to 2004, where the arc flash hazard was first quantified. And then, you know, every few years. And, and so it's, if you don't have a written electrical safety program, then you're not in compliance with 70E. Now, OSHA is going to look at the performance-based uh, aspects of that, but not whether you have that electrical program in, in writing. The relationship, and I actually did, did some reading on this last night. I said, you know, I don't think I've recently read the final rule. If, if, if you really want to get into this, which I'm not saying, you know, is, is, is going to be top, I understand it's not top on your list. You look at these preambles to the final rules of, of uh, OSHA standards. Some of you know this. So this was 1990, so this is 32 years ago that the final rule came out on electrical safety related work practices. And where did they get the information? Where did they get the requirements? Where did OSHA, OSHA doesn't come up with this stuff on its own or in some bubble inside of Washington DC. Guess, guess where they got it all? From NFPA 70E at the time. NFPA 70E and OSHA, now it, OSHA accepts certain parts of it and, 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 and not others, but that's where it came from. So that's the relationship. Uh, currently they've, they've diverged a little bit because OSHA has stayed, you know, 1990, it's still the same standard basically. And 70E has over the, I think it's, I, I think it's improved uh, quite a bit in terms of the clarity, like I said, in terms of the terminology and the information that comes into this committee that is creating this document. All the input, and, I, and I'll show you at least one, one good example of that where I don't know this for a fact, but I'm pretty sure why something changed in terms of the standards requirements, not, not OSHA's requirements. So. This is 2000 uh, on, the, on the left there. It goes back farther than that. But th <laughs> this is really where in 2004 is the first time that I'm aware of that they were able to, that they put into their document a quantification, categorization of the arc flash hazard. 
before that. I mean, arc flashes aren't new, aren't, aren't, uh, yeah, aren't something new. It's mentioned in the final rule that I, that, that I just showed you in the preamble. And th that, of course, is, you know, it's all available online where they talk about arc flash. But they don't talk about it the way 2004 talks about it. And so that's when, like I said, I, I got involved because, hey, we, our big corporation, multinational uh, corporation needs to do something to protect our people from this now recognized hazard. What makes it recognized? You, you know, you, general duty clause, recognized hazard, capable of causing serious injury or death. A, a consensus standard makes it recognized. But you didn't know about this? Uh, well, yeah, no, we didn't. Well, it, it, was, it, was, it was new, right? So maybe there's some time there to get, to get used to that. And then on since then, um, this is the one that, that I really like, that I, that I hold dear to, to, <laughs> to bring it around, well, well used. And I like it because of what's on the cover, right? So th to me, the covers are, are interesting. Um, okay, you got the lightning bolt, and we're kind of, kind of back to the lightning bolt here. I'm not too happy about that, but lockout, tag out, right? Elimination of the hazard, verification. There's a, there's a re separate requirement for electrical voltage, zero voltage verification when you're talking about lockout, tag out, of a, uh, or control of hazardous energy that's electrical, right? So that's, that's a big difference that, that you need to understand because if, you, if your lockout, tag out procedures are simply press the start button to verify that the power's off, and somebody's gonna be doing, changing out a motor, and there's wiring, it's an electrical motor, so if the wires were live, you would get shocked. Th they need to verify zero energy with a meter, period. That's the, that's, that's the law, it just doesn't happen to be in the lockout tagout standard, which is a certain chapter of OSHA, right? 1910-147, it's in the electrical part. So, um, so there's an emphasis there on using a meter, being trained on a meter, and then my favorite is the hierarchy of controls, and I'll show you probably a better picture of that where the, where the pyramid is turned on its head, but at the bottom is PPE, at the top is elimination, right? I mean, safety people, this is kind of drilled into your head at some point, well, maybe not drilled in, at some point you've, you've uh, you know, been exposed to this over the conferences and training and your education and everything. So 70E talks about the hierarchy of controls. You should, once, you, once a hazard um, or risk is identified, they say that's, what's, that's what you have to go to, not, not down to, to PPE right away, but that's, you know, unfortunately, my experience is that's what uh, uh, people skip over those other levels. Ah, so here's, <laughs> here's the matrix I'm going to show you. Jordan showed you the matrix um, for his... Um, uh, incident reporting and whatnot. There's a lot of them out there. This particular one, I, it's just for, if you can read it, um, it's just for me, me to show you one example. You know, his had, uh, you know, the red was down here. This is up here. It depends on, you know, how you um, use these terms. You see there's no numbers on this one, so it's just low, medium, high, et cetera, and then a, a definition of, of what that means. So how can you use this, or can you use this, with electrical safety with NFPA 70E, which says you need to do a risk assessment? There's a requirement in your, so I, I mentioned, it talks about uh, in the programmatic part, right? We haven't gotten to the PPE, which everybody kind of skips to. In the programmatic part, electrical safety program has to include risk assessment. So how do you do a risk assessment for your electrical workers or you know, well, let's say your uh, electrical workers, not just um, electricians, because it could be anybody who uses a meter. I know that's one of the ways, and it's effective, one of the ways OSHA identifies exposures for your employees would be who has a meter? Who's got a meter? Oh, so what do you, what do, you do with the meter? You know, just really innocently, what do you do with the meter? And then it you know, follows from there about training and PPE and everything else. But um, really what the risk assessment is saying is to try to minimize these risks in other methods uh, so that you don't have to work, continue to remind people, you put your gloves on, 
got to wear your gloves when you do that. You're not wearing your gloves. Why aren't you wearing your gloves? Um, so it's tricky when you, I guess the other reason I show this is because a, and, and I ask the guys, usually the guys, right, the, the electricians, okay, how would you rate, how would you rate the consequence of an arc flash? Well, that's a loaded question, because we're not loaded, that's not a fair question, right, because it depends on, on uh, what you're doing, but a lot of them will say it's, it's big, it's high, the consequence is major, I could, you know, I could die, uh, serious, serious injuries, okay. So then how would you rate the likelihood? Mm, Possible, like, uh, unlike, you know, in here somewhere. Well, if it's major and it's in here somewhere, big difference between high and medium, at least on, on this chart. So um, it, that doesn't matter as much as the fact that that's a, that's a pretty significant risk to, to, to uh, as it might rank with some of your other risks that are higher frequency, right, the cuts. And maybe slips and falls, you know, in, in the winter time and whatnot. Although, you know, falls can be obviously very uh, on the on same level, not from height. So, if that equates to it, why are we ignoring this so much? It's tough. One to even just understand the arc flash risk, and two to be able to say, okay, now here's here's what you have to wear now, Don. Really? I got no. I'm not. I mean, I talk to people all the time. I've never worn gloves. How long have you been an electrician? 25 years, 30 years. Oh, okay. That's going to be tough. You know, that's going to be tough. So um, let, let me keep going, and I'll show you a little bit, a little bit about how NFPA 70E talks about risk assessment. So there's the chapter and verse that it that it, that it comes out of out of the 218 uh, 2018 version. So it's asking, and it's saying, all right, and this is this is not hard to understand, right? What are the hazards? This one's a little trickier, right? Likelihood of occurrence and the potential severity. So there's that um, probability severity. And then are additional protective measures required, including the use of PPE, not automatically going to PPE. So my company works with a, a subcontractor who does arc flash analyses, the engineering studies. How many, how many facilities here have had an arc flash analysis done where you get the very few, okay, so it's not required to be done. However, I'll show you where there are, um, if you don't do it that way, then your assessment is going to involve using 70E. And, and uh, you, can, you, you can simplify it, but I think it's, it's, it's really important to go through this exercise. So um, <laughs> this is for your study later, but I, I needed to show you how you come up with, and I spend a, quite a bit of time with the guys on this, with the, excuse me, with, you know, with the electrician, electrical workers, on how shock affects your body. You, they need to know that. It's not part of training that, that uh, you know, is required by, by OSHA. You need to be able to determine voltage, et cetera, et cetera. How can, sh what does shock do to your body, and at what level? And so you, this is a, this is, there's a lot going on here, but it's kind of all there where you have, where you have voltage and you have resistance, and then you've got these lines of, of uh, current, and then the effect on you know the fibrillation on the heart. I you know I, I can't spend a lot of time on this today, but this is a really effective way to determine shock severity, your your potential for the for for the effect on the body. And so what we what I talk about a lot is here, where you've got um, and I apologize for the folks over there, where you've got um, 50 volts is the cutoff that OSHA uses, many of you know this, below which they don't talk about the requirement for PPE, it's a much less um, hazardous situation. Well, why is that? 50 volts corresponds to, uh, if you go up the line here uh, and you look at the, the resistance in, excuse me, the current level that somebody might be exposed to, it takes only 100 milliamps, which is a tenth of an amp, if you have a very, very low current resist, uh, resistance of, uh, on your skin. And so I talk about how that occurs and you know, the effect of water and all that. And so that's the level, that's kind of the worst case. So you're standing in water, you're in a basement, and oh geez, this motor's not working, you touch something. And it's humid, and it's only 120 volts, and what's not shown in here is there are other factors here, 
and one of which is when you get hit, right? When, where your heartbeat is at that particular time. Some of, some of you may know that. It's a vulnerable period. So, I, so I, my, my slide says, you don't control that. How are you going to control where your heartbeat is when you touch something, right? My opinion is every time somebody, not gets away with it, but gets shocked, in my 17-year career, in all the training I've done, two people raised their hands and said they had never been shocked. <laughs> so I was shocked. that. But everybody's been shocked, so how come you're not... Well, what? What's the big deal? It, yeah, it hurts. Or, you know, oh, I had, you know, and, and you have all the stories. Well, how come, you're, you're, how come your heart didn't go into fibrillation? Because you were lucky. I'm not saying it's high probability. If it was high probability, we'd have people dying like mad, you know, and then OSHA would be all over this, and, and, and so would everybody else. But um, it's there. The risk is there. And so the more your folks know and understand it, and you do too, right, to a certain extent, you can say, hey, wait a minute now. And, you know, you can, you can ask for help. Uh, Con OSHA, consulting, you know, your peers, CBIA, somebody to say, look, I got a situation here, and I'm not sure what to do with it. So can't dwell any anymore on that, but that's, that's the um, severity. So now here's the probability, sort of. So 70E and OSHA, but more 70E, I'll you know, keep focused on that. They talk about a, 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 a requirement or these, these distances, these boundaries. And the closer you are to, let's call this an exposed energized part without really getting too you know, into the weeds on that, but there's some exposure here. And within a certain distance, based on the voltage, you need to wear insulated, you know, your, your body should be insulated from that, from that uh, contact. And then beyond that is, and you heard OSHA say it this morning, there's a lot of unqualified, well, he didn't, I don't think he said unqualified, but untrained, un unqualified people getting injured, getting, getting killed, maybe even electrocuted. That's this next boundary. It's farther out. So here's where the... I think the evolution comes in, where, where you've got, uh, and I have it in red because this, oops, sorry, there we go. This used to be 300 volts. And why did it draw, go to 150? And uh, let me back up by saying this, this restricted boundary is this blue area, right? So PPE is required if you're within it. On, on anything over 150 volts, you're supposed to be wearing your PPE. I don't care if you're touching it or not. You should be, have the gloves on. I'm, uh, I'm working here. It's a, it's a foot away. I don't care if I'm not working. I, the gloves are required because of the voltage that it can jump and, and, uh, and all that. So uh, this used to be 300 volts. It went down to 150. I'm thinking people were getting injured at there were a couple of common uh, voltages between 120 and 300. 208 and 240, they happen to be, whatever, right? Those voltages, a lot of people are working at that, and I'm thinking we're working at those and got shocked, right? Got, got, got injured. So 70E talks about approach boundaries, which are based on their information all the, all the years and, and the committees and all the different, I mean, it's well represented, the unions, the contractors, the utilities. You look at the front of the book, it's a, it's a real diverse group that they are adopting, not you shall do this, we were, are going to do this. Our folks have to, have to you know, follow the same rules. Then you move on to arc flash. So arc flash, which again is 70E, the arc flash uh, document? No, standard for electric safety in the workplace, but within the last 17 years has been able to quantify, quantify what this arc flash thing is, which has happened forever, as long as we've had electricity, you know, 100 years or, or so. Um, same kind of thing, right? The same, same requirements. So how is that done? Well, this is where it gets a little squirrely, and I'm just going to do it quickly. So you could do categories. So if you have a, um, a partial analysis of your electrical distribution, your, you know, your infrastructure, et cetera, et cetera, some, some, this, this label can be put on there. And it's interesting because it, it actually talks about different tasks that are done on this thing, you know, this voltage uh, panel board, and these categories correspond to levels of protection. 
So let's, you know, so th therefore, it definitely talks about probability and severity. Why is it a higher um, category to remove a bolted cover than to open a hinge cover? So I talk about that, right? Because it's more likely to drop the bolted cover, and the probability is a little higher to have a have an arc flash associated with, oh God, and then you know, zzz, and and, it, and if you get enough uh, current behind that, you have this explosion. Yeah, that was. A, Pretty simplistic. So here's a detailed analysis. I don't, did, did anybody raise their hand that, 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 that has done this? So this is the bigger players, you know, the bigger players. The, the, the bigger companies have, uh, uh, or, or even a smaller facility from a larger corporation says, you will do an art flash study. It's kind of costly because of all the, all the labor involved. Um, but lots of detail here, and the severity is right there in calories, so it's not temperature, it's calories, it's energy uh, ac across a certain part of your body at a distance that I'm going to be probably working, 18 inches, the length of my arm. And so one of the, you've all had some 70E training. If your folks have had some 70E training as well, if you're electrical folks, what I see missing a lot is nobody explains that training, the kind of the higher level, it, it's kind of like getting general HASCOM training, but not getting the chemical specific training on the chemicals that you're working with. These are the labels that the, well, if, if you don't have these labels, you know, obviously you don't have to train them on this, but to understand the categories, to understand their job as it, I mean, so what does that mean to me? Yeah, okay, I understand, yeah, 70E, you got arc flash, you got all this stuff. How does that apply to what I'm doing? That is missing a lot of times, right? It's just not provided. Um, because oh, it may, might be an online course or, you, or you, know, you go somewhere, that person may be well qualified to do that training but is not able to address your specific um, you know, situation. Common ones, yeah, maybe, but anyway, so uh, I'm not gonna dwell on those because a lot of people haven't had that, but you can get very specific with arc flash, worst case, severity. And then the more generic one, which I'm sure, uh, or on your, you know, your, your panels is, you, you see what it refers to. I mean, it, it's got a, um, it's got the shock and arc flash hazard, and then there it is. Follow all requirements in 70E. I wonder who, you know, who wrote that. Uh, follow all requirements in 70E. Even if you follow some of the requirements in 70E, you're doing well. Uh, so, um, it's important to have labels on your equipment that warn people uh, above 50 volts, right, above 50 volts that there's, a, that, that there's a hazard there. But what if there's no label at all? Okay, well, that, that's certainly uh, common as well. What do you do? So if there's no label, then there are these tables, which I'm just going to run by you and um, outline the process. And it comes down to what the person is doing what, what are they actually, you know, uh, performing? What, what kind of work? And you're able to then categorize that into a, a level. This is for arc flash, right? Not shock. This is arc flash. And then um, you, can, you can use the, use the tape, use, uh, get a third table, right? There's three tables in there. That's, that's really helpful, uh, re really user-friendly. Or you can just simplify it. If you open up this panel, you know, if, if, if you open this up and, uh, you're gonna take not the hinged panel, but the whole so-called dead front, right? You take the whole frame, this whole cover off that includes the hinged one. Here's the deal. It's like you're gonna wear you know, this category two, this, this certain uh, suit and uh, face protection and, and, and gloves, et cetera. You can make it really simple like that. It's kind of like walking into a factory, you gotta have eye protection. Why? Because somewhere in there, there's, there's an eye hazard. Uh, not because things are flying around. Okay. Um, you have the, well, I was going to say you have this in your handout. You have it in your handout and you can't read it in your handout. It's really small. This is just a feel for um, the table in 70E, which I realize I should have. Somebody with good eyes can probably read it. But it's a task. A task and then a, and I'll show you how this relates to risk. It's a task, a, a condition of the equipment that the person is working on and then is it likely to have an arc flash hazard? Well, how the heck did they get this, the, you know, where did this come from? 
Well, it's risk assessment from all the input to 70E. And the, the one that, that is most common, I'll say, is when people are doing troubleshooting, voltage testing, the power's on, you got a meter, you're trying to figure it out. That's listed right here, even though you can't read it. So it's any type, any uh, condition of equipment, yes, there's a likelihood of an arc flash, period. Now, that's a, that's a, it happens to be above um, a certain voltage, but basically it's, there's an arc flash hazard. Uh, and, and, and we'll leave it at that. So what does likelihood mean? They don't divide it into those, like on, on the matrix where you've got, you know, uh, absolutely positively gonna happen versus rare. It's just likely or not, <laughs> right? So they simplify it down to that. You, you can read that. So it's an estimate. Yeah, so it's probably in the middle of that matrix that I showed you where there is a definitely a, a difference between a medium on that particular uh, chart, a medium and a high. You know, those two lines sort of down the middle. It excludes the, you know, the, the ones at the end. So if you go down the middle of that matrix, uh, across the middle of that matrix that I showed you, that's pretty much what you've got here. Uh, so that's what you're supposed to take as a starting point, yep, the guys need to wear the, the, the PPE, and then there's another thing you can't read where maybe where you've got, um, what's the equipment? The voltage is the key, but not the only thing. And then, and then um, uh, it, it also has some other things which get really technical, which is about how much um, can flow uh, through that equipment in what period of time, how, how many uh, uh, amps? So again, I had no exposure to circuit breakers and fuses as a safety professional up until the point, in, like I said, that I had to get into this. I was focused on what? Ground fault circuit interrupters, they save lives. It's very important, yes, from a shock hazard. But from an arc flash hazard, I had to educate myself, and I'm not an expert, on fuses and circuit breakers because that's what controls, that's the biggest thing that controls the arc flash is how quickly it shuts off. I said, what do you mean how quickly it shuts off? If it's a, if it's a 30 amp circuit breaker and I've got 20,000 amps that this transformer is going, to, is going to release because of a short circuit that somebody caused by dropping you know, a, a tool or something, I don't understand. It's a 30, it's a 30 amp breaker. Well, it's not instantaneous. It's not instantaneous. There's a fraction of a second where it's like a spigot on a big tower of water, and you open the spigot down there, oh, you know, and if you close it really fast, you still get a gush. You can't close it fast enough. So circuit breaker kind of acts like that. So I had to educate myself on what that all means. And so that's, it. that's included in this table. They have these so-called parameters. So again, it gets, gets really technical, but then you choose, it, it gives you an arc, sorry. You, it gives you an arc flash PPE category, one, two, three, four. And there are, there are levels there. It also tells you boundaries. Well, what the heck is the boundary? So now you've got, and that's the parameter thing. Um, so the boundary is really the severity, uh, the estimate of the, of the severity. And I tell people uh, to be careful with this because this is the, it used to be called the flash protection boundary. It's an arc flash boundary. It's a it's a decision that was made to give you a, um, a distance that you, within which you're not going to get a serious burn, which they call a second degree or greater burn. Step back a little bit. It's all based on distance for this explosion um, once it occurs. So you, don't you still get burned? Yeah, just not as badly. So they've, they've almost, not arbitrarily, they've said, we're going to cut that off at a certain level and tell people that's the arc flash uh, boundary. And this is what arc flash is based on, primarily, primarily this, the fault duration. Yes, 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 but how quickly it's, it, it can, be, can be stopped. Um, and, and I show this, I don't know how many, how many people show this in their training, but I show this as saying, okay, the boundary is between the red and the yellow. You're still in a, in a curable burn zone. Oh, great, so I can get a really nasty sunburn if I'm, if I'm standing in here. Yes, you can, because, because this, is the, this is what um, 70s is, is trying to protect you against. The, the non-curable, nasty burn. 
I don't know what the, and, and you, you know, you, you can do the calculations because of course the farther back you stand. So you know, any of this should be looked at as distance is, is your friend. And so if you don't have to be close, you have to tell, the, you should tell the guys, no, one person, and then you establish these boundaries to keep people away. Uh, and so here's that same table, but now with the arc flash uh, boundary superimposed, but you don't know what it is. It could be inside or it could be outside that other boundary. So you can have a shock boundary that you have to wear PPE in. Okay, fine, the blue, but then is the, you know, the, the green is, all right, I'm keeping people out this far. Well, what if the arc flash boundary is way out here? Then, then, and again, you get that from 70E. You, you, you can get that from 70E. So my, my strong recommendation is, is to, to get somebody or to, you, you can translate these multiple tables in 70E into a spreadsheet. This is what we're going to use. You, if you're doing this, here's the PPE and, and uh, here's the boundary. And so you, you make it simple. You make a field version of the, of the document. It, it's very helpful. I have, I don't know, maybe 20, 25% of my clients are doing that. And of course, I, I'm able to share that. I said, well, do you want to see a better way to do it? Um, so that's, that's often missing. Most of the time it's missing because people get training. Here's the 70E, the handouts. We used to do it too. My, my, my firm used to do it too. And you have a handout with all those tables on it. Come on. So what? You, what? You know, I, I, don't, I don't even want to look at that stuff. So um, back to this, though, in the, in the uh, last 10 minutes or so, anything you can do to reduce this, and it's not just arc flash hazard, right? It's the shock hazard, too. How, how are you um, using elimination in, for uh, electrical safety? What's elimination? It's control of hazardous energy. I, I mean, I, it's not the only example, where you have lockout tag out. Right, you're, you're not working live at all. The catch there, when, when, when people have told me, oh, we, we don't do any live work, okay. Uh, how do you verify zero energy for lockout tag out with a meter? Or do you, or uh, uh, how do you do that? Hopefully they say with a meter, I said, well, that's considered live work. Well, what do you mean? Well, you're verifying to see if, it's, if there's voltage there. So there could be voltage there. So even though it's a lower, I mean, let's face it, it's a lower risk because it's it probably shut off because you shut it off and now you're just verifying. You're making, you're bringing the, the risk down really, really, really low because the severity is really, 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 you know, is, is quite a bit higher because you touch something and, you know, there, of course, there are examples. And when OSHA talks about, I was thinking about this during one of the presentations, uh, uh, causing or likely to cause serious injury or death. You don't think OSHA has all kinds of has caused serious injury or death for the kind of work that your folks are doing? Just because it hasn't happened in your facility, it's happened. It's causing. It doesn't say it's causing at company XYZ. It's causing this, this, uh, uh, this severity. So uh, it, that's important to keep in mind for now general duty clause while I'm, while I'm thinking of it. They don't use it for, uh, for electrical very much because it's in there, even though it's not specific about arc flash. They talk about electrical hazards, protecting people from electrical hazards. Well, that's a recognized hazard. So it's, you know, it's kind of in there, but as, um, as, as was mentioned just before lunch, the general duty clause is only going to be used, can only be used if there's not a more specific standard in OSHA. Uh, and then you work your way down the list. Can you substitute? Here's a, Here's a great example of taking a certain circuit breaker. Again, this is for an electrical engineer or somebody who's knowledgeable in, in that field to say, you know, if we change this fuse to a current limiting fuse, it's called, or if we change this circuit breaker so that, and some of the circuit breakers have little adjustments on them for maintenance mode, it's called, you know, all the stuff that, that you can get into from an engineering standpoint to um, substitute and make, and absolutely affect the severity of uh, particularly of arc flash. Or even one of the examples that was given, something I was reading last night was machines have, let, let's say your machinery, if you're you know, in a, in a uh, facility that has machines that run on 480 volts, there's also something called control voltage, right? That would be at 
12 volts, 24 volts, and sometimes 120 volts. So you could take that control voltage on some of the older machines, that's 120, which can still give me the palpitation or the uh, fibrillation and drop it maybe to, to 24. New machinery, you see a lot of improvement with uh, engineering controls, which is guarding, right? Guarding, shielding, covers. If you, if you open up machines now, and I do, again, a lot of training on older and newer machines, the newer machines, there's, there's covers on these. Now, you can see through them, but it's rated polycarbonate plastic, you know, so people don't touch it and it inadvertently. The definition that, that 70E uses for exposed is capable of being inadvertently contacted by a person. Now, that's not subject to, you know, interpretation, but that's their definition. I've yet to really find it in OSHA. You know, what is exposed electrical? How do you define exposed electrical? Well, 70E has that definition. It's helpful, helpful, but again, you, you know, you kind of need to calibrate on that. So that's what I do in my training. Show these pictures. I go, okay, who thinks this is exposed and who thinks this is, you know, protected? So there's some judgment there. But that's, a, that's new equipment. We'll have it. Just like a lot of, you know, guarding and, and, and things are uh, on on machinery, which you can see. A lot of times you won't see that, right? Because you, you, hopefully you're not there when people are opening up these, you know, these uh, equipment control panels. And then administrative would be training, would be procedures, work practices. And then lastly is PPE. But you know, it comes down to, a lot of times, to the PPE. So you've got PPE level two on this particular one for this um, energy level. There's your boundary. They even talk about your underwear, um, you know, and it, it, arc flash and shock. So it, it, it's kind of all there, but unless you train somebody to be able to interpret that and then apply that to, you know, to, to what they've been um, given, are they given the PPE? Is it, and it, it was explained earlier, is the, has it been explained to somebody, you know, how, how you take care of your voltage rated gloves, et cetera? Um, so this is an example of, of, of a category two or a level two um, ensemble, right? Protecting uh, the worker from arc flash as well as shock hazard. And sometimes you get two for one. So you've got two for one here. You've got uh, underneath those leather gloves are rubber voltage rated gloves, which are here somewhere, over the voltage rated gloves. Um, this is for Ah, level two. So this is for just the arc flash hazard, but he's saying here, it's, we're saying here it's over, over the voltage rated. So, but this is all, um, you know, part of that, that, again, the culture change. I've seen it take at least one company where I was, you know, creating this worldwide document in the early 90s, or uh, no, not in the early 90s, early, uh, in the mid-2000s. It took a good 10 years, really, to get, uh, you know, to, to get through this. So, if you're a smaller company, you've got, you know, your one maintenance person, this, this is going to be, this is going to be a challenge. Uh, but it's important to, to provide that, I think, that level of education and uh, understanding and to keep away the people that you've heard OSHA talk about with uh, that are often getting injured because they don't have the training. They're unqualified. And... Um, OSHA defines, if, if, if you go into this, this preamble, this, you know, you read about how this law came about, there, there was a lot of discussion because just like there are, uh, 70 is a committee, when OSHA, before they issue a final rule, they have, they have hearings, right? They have committee hearings. Some of you know this, maybe have participated in that. And they'll get input. And so that's all written to this, into this document, which you can access. And it talks about well, so-and-so brought up this, and OSHA considered it, and yeah, they made some changes. OSHA considered that, and they said, no, we're going to stick with, you know, with the rule. So um, the, the, the uh, alerting techniques is a performance-based standard. Excuse me, it's, it's performance-based in OSHA, meaning it has to work. It has to be effective, but you can do, you know, I recommend some kind of a barricade. Not that you couldn't go through that, but safety signs or tags, eh, you know. Not so effective. Attendance, yeah, you might you, you might need somebody if it's a, if it's the main door to the you know the cafeteria or something and, and it's it's break time. So this is 
the, probably the most important things for, for training would be for the qualified people, meaning, and the qualified is a qualified definition because you're qualified in, uh, you have to have knowledge of the equipment that you're working on. So you, you know, wouldn't be qualified to work on everything in the facility. A lot of places have facilities, larger places have facilities maintenance and machine maintenance. So there'd, there'd be two different levels of qualification there. As, and OSHA even puts that in, in in a little paragraph to say, it's likely that you're going to be um, restricted. You should re restrict these folks to, to certain um, pieces of equipment. We, we do a lot of this now, which is in addition to a classroom training, and it's very effective. Of course, it costs more to have, to have like, say, somebody like me train one-on-one. -on -one. Show me how you would change this motor out. And you know they have the gear, and they have to go through shutting off the power and testing with a meter, and you know following all the you know making sure the PPE is tested, all of that. That's the demonstration part of it. A lot of you may be having a quiz or something as part of your training. Well, that's the knowledge part, but you're not demonstrating um, that the uh, you know the ability to actually perform that. It's kind of like what you should be doing with lockout tagout. Right, every year you're evaluating your authorized people in their ability to follow your lockout tagout procedure. Well, there's no requirement in OSHA to, to do that for electricians other than when you first train them to demonstrate that, um, that they understand that this is when they're to wear the gloves and then that's when I get into, uh, well, you could touch that, no, I can't, I'm working down here, you know, all the nuances that I certainly don't have time to go into today. Uh, it's very effective, and it's something that I would highly recommend. Even if you have to do it, you know, in a, uh, you know, in, in, in cost is, obviously, if there's only one or two people, cost is going to be a challenge. Um, and then last is to, uh, is to ensure that the, uh, the so-called unqualified, electrically unqualified people stay out of, stay out of harm's way. Uh, they, they need training as well. If you give your entire facility some electrical awareness training, that's great. You need to give the folks that are uh, working near, uh, you know what it's like? It's like with lockout tagout, where you have authorized and affected, right? And then everybody, in electrical, um, in the electrical safe work practices, you have qualified and unqualified. That's where one area where I've seen 70E not be particularly effective because they say, or not helpful because they say uh, unqualified means not qualified. OSHA goes a little more than that. They define some of the folks that are unqualified, um, even supervisors, people doing painting, machine operators, you know, folks who may need to understand that that's, that's not an area that they, that they should be going uh, close to. So uh, very important, and, and, you know, the people that are getting in trouble might, might be a mechanic, might be somebody who is trying to, people are trying to do the right thing. Right? They're trying to put the machine back in, in service. They're trying to fix the, the thing so that they can get back, but they're not looking out for themselves as much as they, as they could be. And it's low probability but high severity if you, you, know, if you do a risk assessment. And I am at zero, so I'm going to thank you very much. Don, Don uh, we do have a time for a couple of questions. Uh, we do have one that's online. And it reads as follows. How much focus is being ap applied to reducing the incident energy level by replacing, energy, replacing older non-current limiting fuses with, taste, <laughs> with, with tester clearing times? Ouch. <laughs> um, current limiting fuses are extremely effective. They, again, this is the area that I had to and I'm continuing to, to understand where, um, and I show a video, some of you may have seen it, there's a, the uh, Institute of Electrical, uh, you know, the IEEE uh, organization has, has these tests that they do, and there's a test where there's a dummy in, in front of a, uh, I'll end with this, there's a uh, dummy in, fr in, in, in front of this panel, and there's an explosion, and it's, you know, thousands of amps, and it's 480 volts, it's all over in uh, it's all over in six cycles, which in alternating current language is a tenth of a second. 
tenth of a second. Oh man, that's really fast. Big explosion, nasty burns would, would occur. They put in a current limiting device, fuse probably, uh, they don't really say, and it goes from a tenth of a second. This is, this is kind of the world that, you know, that, that, uh, that I had to understand, try to keep understanding. Tenth of a second to three one thousandths of a second. So in three one thousandths of a second, I think it's 22,000 amps get, it, yes, it flows, but it's just this little poof, you know, and, and you see just a little bit of, of uh, you know, plasma or something, and maybe the, the, uh, the you know, the, the person would get a slight burn. Um, as opposed to a tenth of a second, right? That circuit breaker opens in a tenth of a second, it's a big explosion. So uh, that's, that's the kind of, uh, uh, you know, levels that, that need to be uh, addressed. And so currently, I think the question was, you know, how effective is very, very effective. And that's something that as you go forward and, you know, you include it into a, an upgrade, a maintenance work, you, you somehow build it into an existing plan Always good to integrate safety, right? As opposed to, we gotta replace all our fuses, that's gonna cost, no. As we replace fuses, give people the fuses that can, uh, or the, you know, the uh, equipment that can reduce the severity. Hope that, hope that helped the person online. Thank you. Thank you.